Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I'm your host, Jay Connor, known as the Private Money Authority, and I'm just so glad you're here. So you may be viewing live on the StreamYard right now, or you may be listening to our podcast. It's on iTunes and Google Play, or you may be watching on YouTube or et cetera. Regardless as to whether you're watching or listening live or you are uh, listening or watching the replay, we're glad you're here. And, I've, you know, we launched my podcast. We launched the show, My Lens. It was June 2018. I can't believe that much time has gone by. But anyway, we have another show today and I've got a very special guest. We're in a high end mastermind meeting together and his name is Jim Shields. Let me tell you a little bit about Jim and then we're going to bring him in from the green room. So Jim, he's been a full time real estate investor all the way back since 1999. So Jim's been doing it longer than me. I went full time in 2003 and uh, Jim's ventures have done over one thousand acquisitions and rehabs. That's a lot of properties, folks. So getting a start in the Bakersfield, California, he left there in 2005, headed over to Northeast Florida. That's where he is now to follow the long-term growth patterns that were predicted for that area. So after 2008, and of course, as you'll recall, it was because of 2008 and 2009, that's how I became known as the private money authority. I was cut off from the banks and uh, learned how to get a lot of private money fast. Nonetheless, after 2008, Jim's company did a bulk of foreclosure properties until switching their model to new construction to adapt to the changing market conditions and needs. So Jim forming a very dynamic uh, building partnership called Jack's Wealth Investments, they now focus on catering to investors in single family and small multi-unit development in Jacksonville, Ocala, Palm Coast, and Atlanta, Georgia as well. Now, the big reason that I've got Jim here on the show today is because he runs a family education company called 18 Summers. And I can't wait to hear the story behind him naming it that. But what uh, this education company does is it specializes in talks, workshops, and retreats for entrepreneur families. He, Jim also wrote his best-selling book titled The Family Board Meeting that went to number one in categories of relationships, parenting, and entrepreneurship. So Jim is an expert in training and teaching on how to have balance in your life and in your business. In addition to that, Jim is also an avid surfer. He enjoys traveling with his family particularly when we come out of COVID-19, the travel will be turned back on and especially loves traveling with his beautiful wife, Jamie, and their four children. So anyway, what an adventurous guy. And Jim's greatest adventure today was donating a kidney to the greatest guy on this planet from his perspective. And that of course was his father. So with that, Jim, welcome to the show. Hey, Jay, good to see you. Good to it be here. Great to see you, fellow CG member. Great to have you here on the show, Jim. And so I'm just so excited to have this conversation with you about balance in life, balance in business, and to learn more about your workshops and your and your retreats that you do. But I gave I gave the folks part of your background, but you started back in 1999. Uh, how did you start? What got you into it? Yeah, I had always wanted to do something on my own. And like most entrepreneurs, I started delving into everything from franchises to other business opportunities. And I kept falling back on real estate and I liked the tangibility of it. It made sense to me, you know, how to how to take something and pull the levers to add cash flow, to add equity. That made sense. And and so I just slowly started going into real estate investments out in Central California where Bakersfield, California was the butt of Johnny Carson's jokes for years, but it was an investor's <laughs> playground where the properties started at forty to fifty thousand dollars, which was a lot better than uh, you know, Santa Barbara County two two hours over the median price was nine hundred thousand. So I just uh, I had always had a knack for it. Yeah, it was crazy, crazy, crazy. So yeah, that's how I got my start. I knew I wanted to do something on my own and I just started getting training 
in real estate and pulling the trigger. You know, and I always joke, what's your, what's the best real estate class you ever took? And I say 432 North M street. That was the first property I ever bought, you know, 21 years ago. So that, that was my best lesson ever. Wow. That's an amazing story. So, so in your introduction that I was sharing with folks, you did like over a thousand acquisitions and rehabs and et cetera. But uh, what was it that caused you to switch over to your new model and tell everybody more about what your new model is? Yeah, well, I guess I always wore that badge on my shoulder, right? I'm a rehabber. I'm a rehabber. And, you know, it's tough to teach the, the old dog new tricks. And I was the old dog by then. You got used to something. And we did really well coming out of 2008 here, you know, when, when there was all that bank inventory, we got really good at finding foreclosures and renovating them and putting them in our own portfolio or working with other investors to build theirs. And the problem was, Jay, about five years ago, man, those numbers started to change. You know, they, they, they were getting bid up. The, the numbers weren't making sense. You'd have to cut corners if you really want to make the numbers work. And I don't like to cut corners. So my now building partner who I had done deals with before said, you know, we should try some new construction. And that was almost like, wow, what, what are you saying? Don't, those are, that's a terrible word. What, we're rehabbers. And sure enough, it was the right thing to do because we weren't able to find old house inventory anymore where the numbers worked. But although new construction, so we basically do build to rent now. We build new construction homes that are designed just for investment property. And we focus on single family duplexes and quads. But what we've been able to find is better inventory. It takes longer. There's more effort to it, Jay. You know, so we had to you know, learn some new muscles with developing and zoning and longer time frames. But overall, for ourselves and our clients, it's more predictable, better areas, better properties, better longevity, just a stronger overall investment. So it's, it was a big jump five years ago, but I'm really glad to the point now where I used to have that big rehab badge on my shoulder, I refuse to do rehabs anymore. I just won't do them. I've just completely switched over to the other side. Okay, excellent, excellent. Well, let's dive right on into 18 Summers and what that is, how you got the name and why you started doing it. Yeah, so 18 Summers was a lesson that a mentor of mine taught me. I first started doing family talks when I had written my book, you know, bunch of years ago. And he said to me, Jim, you're, you're really onto something because there's so much out there that's available for the entrepreneur to grow their business, but not to keep their family intact. And what I always wanted to see, and I saw this at a young age, I, got, I was able to get on stages at a young age at different events because I had some success in real estate. But I saw some people who were highly successful in business and they were completely failing at home. And frankly, Jay, that scared me. I didn't want that to be me. So this was out of my own necessity and need to make sure that I stayed in that success in business and success at home combination. And so my mentor was talking about that and he said, look, the years are not all created equal. You got 18 summers. He's like, and I looked it up, the stats show 85% of the quality time people, the average person ever gets with their family, their children, occurs by the end of the 18th summer because then they start to go off and the amount of time frame goes down. And that just gave me a positive motivation. And now when I went into my talks and workshops, that gave the same positive motivation to others. How do we make the most of that time without taking away ambition? Because I'm very ambitious, you know, being an entrepreneur, but I want to have that double success, Jay, success in work and success at home. So 18 Summers became, I believe, the, the only family education outlet designed specifically for entrepreneur families to make sure that you can have the best of both worlds. I got you. That's fantastic. So let me let you put on your training hat <laughs> on your, on your coaching hat right now and share with our audience. What are some of the strategies that you teach and train at your workshops on how to achieve that kind of balance? Sure. Let's go through a couple of principles that I think will stick with people. One of the best compliments I get is what we teach is very stickable. It's easy to understand, easy to buy into, easy to apply and see results. So let's give a couple of those today. You know, going through our world changed, as you know, Jay, post COVID, you know, it's everything got brought home, work, family, school, you know, everything's happening from home. So a couple of things came into light. 
And one of the things is the importance that you have in the position of your family of setting the leadership tone. You know, focus breeds increase. And people were talking about toddler meltdowns and teen grumpiness. Can those things be eliminated? No, but they can be minimized. And I believe a lot of it has to do with how are you handling yourself in front of your family? You are setting the tone. And sometimes we forget that, that it's that trickle down effect. And so I always try to remind people, what's, what tone are you setting at home? You know, what, what tone are you setting? And one of the worst tones that you can set when you're having a bad business deal, when everyone's pulled you know, onto the sidelines by something like a COVID-19 is, do you have the awareness to step back and say, hey, this is not my family's fault? Now, a lot of people don't even think about that, but that's really important because you get wrapped up in a deal going wrong or you're, you're taking a call in your living room, which you shouldn't be. You should be separated and your kids acting like a kid and yelling. You get upset, you know, or you say, well, no, I'm not taking it out on them. But when you stop and think, if we're, if we're showing shortness, anxiety, a little bitterness, and our family's feeling the brunt and it has something to do with business and not them, that's not a good tone to set. We got to remember, it's not our family's fault when these big things happen. And also we set the leadership tone. If we can show ourselves to be stronger leaders, more calm, more playful, more not, I'm not saying overly optimistic, you know, like purple, you know, the rose colored glasses, but that sets a tone that will trickle down to your spouse and children. What I love about that principle, and I'm glad you call it a principle because what you just said is so foundational. What I love about it, it reminds me of uh, Jack Canfield's very first principle in his book, Success Principles, which is, I am 100% responsible, right? Yep. And, and what you just went over is, is you are bringing to light there that what we're experiencing in our home life yeah. is, a manifest, is a manifestation of us. <laughs> So that's, that's excellent. Excellent. Very yeah, foundational. It, get, it gets us back to the foundation, back to the core. And that's really important, especially when you, you're thrown into a bunch of deals or you're thrown into a pandemic, we all get shook up. So then we have to breathe and, and reground our feet. And that's one of the best things to remember. I set the tone and I'm not going to set it perfectly, but the better I set it, the, the better things are going to be. So that's a big one. A second one, Jay, that I love is uh, we all heard about in COVID again, not to keep going back to COVID, COVID about social distancing, right? I, that's, I get it. That made sense. But what about tech distancing? The principle of tech distancing, Jay, is absolutely essential right now. Essential. And it's got two parts to it. First, if you're home, don't be work puking in your living room. So let's say you're standing there, your family's having a nice family moment, that buzz in your pocket happens with a text or you're taking a phone call, and then all of a sudden you're getting heated in front of them or you get off the phone and you're standing there with a scowl because something didn't go right. You've now just mixed over the lines and that's just not fair. It's, it's, you're, you're, we call it half-in parenting. You're trying to be part of the family, take a tough work call, and especially through a pandemic or something, they might've been some pretty heavy conversations. And maybe it's not something our younger kids needed to hear. I always say first step of tech distancing is you got to distance yourself from your family to take calls, emails. And then before you step in, take a few deep breaths and then you go back in. But I can tell you the day two of the pandemic, Jay, I, I was helping someone who was in a bad real estate way. And they were in commercial. They had a bunch of lease stores. It was, it was heavy. And I was feeling like they were getting taken advantage of. And I was, I was passionate. I cared about this person and their deal. Well, I'm texting. I put the thing away and I'm kind of talking to myself like the crazy entrepreneur I am. My little five-year-old standing in front of me and she goes, Daddy, why are you so mad at me? I didn't even see her standing there. And so it's like, wow. Again, talk about setting the leadership tone. I said, there's a time and a place for these calls and it's not right in the kitchen with my kids around me. So the first step of tech distancing, have a time and a place whether if you couldn't get to your office, I don't care if it's a closet or your car, where you're going to take those emails, you're going to take those calls, you're going to find a quiet place, even though I have four loud kids to do a podcast, right? So that, that we can talk and we can do this. And then the second side of tech distancing, Jay, is you have to have times of being completely and totally unavailable to work, to be with the people in front of you. If you're always snagging that text or that Facebook thread or, or, or that call or email, you'll never truly be present. 
you'll always be getting pulled out of things. And then you'll be going, geez, we don't really seem that connected. And we've all tried that where we fake like we're listening to our spouse or one of our children. And, and they notice, we think maybe they didn't notice that we didn't hear what the hell they said, but it, it just sets a really bad tone. So you got to have times where you're completely and totally unavailable, shut off. We, we do a shut off every day at our house, Jay, 5.30 to 7.30. It is a tech fast, tech distancing. There's no phone, no laptop, no TV. Everyone is just, we're not sitting there staring at each other, but all tech is off. So that way, you know, the people right in front of us or the conversation can flow without an interruption. That is an excellent suggestion. I mean, what I do to where, to where I'm not even tempted to, you know, respond to this, right? Is yep, yep. I, go, I go put it in another room. <laughs> to yep. where, I can't, Me too. where I can't see it, I can't hear it vibrate. And I love this, again, principle that you're sharing. And it, as you were explaining it, it reminds me of a mentor that I had decades ago. And he used to tell me all the time, he'd say, Jay, wherever you are, be there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and we, I'll tell you, real estate investors, we, we wear this badge like, I'm always available. I got to work this deal. Almost anything can wait two hours. That's right. Almost anything. I've, and there is nothing more rude. We say, we got to provide, we got to protect, we got to get the deal through. I get it. I've been a real estate investor 20 years. But to jump up from the dinner, dinner table for, for a mundane detail is setting a really bad example for what matters most and for would you want your kids doing that down the road? The answer is probably no. So no, a little bit so you're, again, you're setting you're you're setting the example. I love it. Exactly, love it'll it. go down. So the tech distancing is is a very powerful and simple one. People think about it. It's okay to turn off and recharge, and even as a real estate investor. You know, a one hour a day can do wonders if you're doing it during the things during during certain hours where you're around your family. You'll start to see, wow, we're having deeper conversation. I actually am seeing things. I'm actually listening. I'm, this is incredible. But even if that phone's just on, you're waiting for that, zzz, zzz, you know, in that pocket, your, your brain goes out the window. So practice tech distancing, Jay, it works huge. Another thing that's really important right now, especially, this is good, especially you being the private money guy, you know, non-QM money went away. You know what I mean? There's lots of stuff that's changed. I believe certain real estate is going to do phenomenal. Others are going to be challenged. But Jay, if I learned anything in 2008, and we survived 2008, we were heavily invested in California and Florida at the time. That was not a pretty sight to go through 2008. You know, values dropped 60%, rents dropped 40%. Uh, totally different time. Uh, and I'm more excited now, obviously, than I was in 08. But let me tell you, Jay, there's two things people have to look for right now. This is going to be good for real estate investors. You should get support, but there's two types of support out there. There's moral support and there's technical support. Now, in 2008, I would take as much moral support as I could get. You should be giving some of your friends and family coming through the pandemic or a challenge moral support, but you might not be in the position to give technical support. And there's a big difference. I remember in 08, people were wanting to help me, you know, through the real estate things. They wanted to give me technical support and they weren't really in the position to do so. Where I'm sure, Jay, you've had the same thing where you know private money. But there's sometimes you see that out there, it's almost like the, the baker's trying to teach you how to cut meat. It doesn't go together, right? If you, you go to the butcher to learn how to cut meat, not the baker. Go to the baker for baking the bread. But there's always that, that crossover. So I always encourage people to save efficiency and effectiveness to have more time with your family. There's two types of support out there. There's moral support. Take as much as you can and give as much as you can. There's technical support. Technical support, Jay, there's probably, I bet you you'd say there's probably maybe three, four people in, in the world you'd feel comfortable talking on your niche. And that's it. And that's what I've learned. There's only about two to three groups that I go to for overall, what's the economy going to do real estate wise? And I go to people who have a track record, people who called things for many more years than I've been even investing and have real teams set up that show a track record. And I think that's really important right now in today's day and age. You want to get the best results, like exactly what you're doing. You're given technical support because you've been there, done that. But the problem is sometimes we still go for technical support to people who aren't really in the position to give it, if that makes sense. Yeah. What does, what does giving moral support 
mean to you? What does giving moral support look like or sound like? Yeah. So, uh, for example, I had I had friends that really struggled in in retail post COVID. I could give them moral support, Jay. I've never done large retail. I've never never had thousands of employees. That just wasn't my thing. So there was there was a fringe type of technical, but for the most part saying, Hey, I'm thinking about you, you know, hang in there. You know, there's, there's gotta be other guys going through this, find out what they're doing, but I wasn't going to be the one to stand up on the lifeguard chair and, and point for where they should go. Cause frankly, I didn't know. So the advice is more to tell them to keep going, to hang in there, call if you need anything, don't get too down on yourself. Remember, self-worth and, and net worth got nothing to do with each other. Your family's still going to be there no matter what happens. Your real friends will be there. That's moral support. Technical yeah. support is saying, look, here's how you renegotiate a, you know, a multi-package lease. Here are the groups that are, are holding off on inventory control where you could get your inventory paid down to a third of what they would have charged you. I don't know how to do that. I know it has to. So I'd be, I'd be faking it and that wouldn't be right to do to them. Yeah. Yeah. I believe uh, I agree with everything you just said. And in addition to that, sometimes the best moral support that we can give people is a sincere listening ear. That's it. <laughs> sometimes you don't have to say anything. They just get it off their chest. You release it. I remember I had a lot of releasing conversations in 2008, Jay, you know, and people just listened. And that's sometimes that that's, it, it clears your head just to get it out. And that, that's really powerful. That's really also awesome. powerful. Dan so, Muhorter uh, is uh, is here with us live. He just uh, commented one of the great things about uh, Jay Connors Mastermind is we give and get moral support and technical su support. Well, that's so true. And that's a great thing about masterminds. You know, the, the mastermind that you and I are in, Jim, that's, that, that's all about giving and receiving uh, the technical support and the moral support. You know, and, and plus, another thing that I've discovered over the years. When it comes to us entrepreneurs, and I've, I've, uh, my experience has been this relates to men and women, there's just not, the majority of the people walking around don't understand us. <laughs> does not understand. The, does not We're understand oddballs. The, do what? We're I'm, oddballs. Exactly. So it's like, you know. <laughs> Like, like a lot of people don't understand now, the people that are listening to this podcast, they get it because people listening to this show have an entrepreneur spirit or they're interested in entrepreneurial things. But, you know, we have this thing called it's hard to turn this this real estate off in between our ears. Right. And, um, you know, people accuse us of being workaholics. Well, you know, it's really a challenge not to do what I do because I don't even view it as work. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's just what we do. But anyway, these are great strategies. Did you have one more strategy you want to share with us, or or do you or do you keep it to threes? Yeah, I do keep it to threes. But let me let me give you a bonus one that that's been really powerful for people. And this is like the cheat of cheats. You know, if if you want to you, you want a healthy shortcut, this is one of them. Your spouse, your children. If you want to have a good relationship with each of them or up the odds of that, you got to have one-on-one -on -one time. One-on-one -on -one time, this is something I learned in our retreats because we would do whole family retreats and just retreats with one parent, and one child. The, the potency of one-on-one -on -one time, like a date with your spouse, a day with your phone off and just one of your children, let's say you're crazy like me and have four, it, it just it puts the magnifying glass on the relationship in a positive way. And it opens up new conversations and attention that, you know, big family gatherings won't. Like I'm, I come from an Irish Catholic family, which means I had like 7,000 cousins, you know, and that's, that's great. But those big, those big events are great, but it's the one-on-one -on -one time that's had the biggest effect on the, my marriage and on the relationship with my kids. So I would say, just like you're going to schedule with your biggest investors to find your deals, Schedule one-on-one -on -one time with your spouse and your children, and you'll be amazed the difference and, and the depth that you get to just by those deposits of one-on-one -on -one time. It works. Wow. I love it. I love it. Well, Jim, I, I can tell you what, I also know just in our visit here on the show, you've got a servant's heart. I, I pick up on it and I, and I appreciate you coming on here and, 
and sharing just fantastic information on, on, on how people to really take care of themselves, grow their relationships, nurture the relationships that they have. So let's give out your website, Jim, because I know our listeners and audience would really like to uh, continue to connect with you. Yeah, if you're if you're interested in our rent to uh, build to rent model, you just go to jackswealthinvestments.com, J A X wealthinvestments.com. And if you're wanting a little help uh, on the family side, making sure that your family is successful as your business grows, uh, just go visit us at 18summers.com. That's 18summers.com. That's awesome. Jim, thank you so much. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you, Jay. Good to be here. All right. Okay, everybody, there you have another show. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. Everybody stay safe here in the midst of uh, COVID-19 as we come out on the other side. And I'm wishing you all the best. Here's to taking your real estate investing business to the next level. We'll see you on the next show. Bye for now.